Today we're going to look at the initial feasible solution. Um, notice on the board, I've, you, we no longer have to graph it out, but I graphed it out so you could visually see what is going on. Um, I've created uh, three extreme points, ZA, ZB, and ZC. Um, even though ZA is not in our feasibility region, all simplex, the initial feasible solution starts at ZA or zero, 0, for our coordinates. And then we mathematically step around our uh, feasibility region to determine the optimal solution. Um, so that's what's going on mathematically, so you probably want to keep that in mind. All right, with simplex, uh, we follow basically six steps. Last time we looked at placing uh, the equation in what was called standard form. Uh, we did that both for the constraints and the objective functions. Today we're going to look at the initial feasible solution. Next we'll test for an optimal solution. You know, have we reached the extreme point that's that's optimal. It will give us the largest profit or reduce our profit or reduce our costs the most. Uh, step four, we check if it's not optimal, we have to identify which is the next point we're going to. We do that by identifying the entering and leaving variables. Um, from there, we generate an improved solution. And basically, step six is we keep repeating three through six until we get to the optimal solution. Okay, now we're going to look at uh, setting up the simplex table or tableau. I guess it's kind of like Target. We have a tableau. Um, but you notice on the left is what's called the basis. Um, basis is our, uh, uh, the variables we'll be using. C stands for the constant. Um, if you move to the middle section, um, the top there is where we put the objective function in standard form. Again, we'll have the constants and the objective function for that. In the middle is what's called the substitution rate. Um, initially, when we start at 0, 0, this equals our constraints in standard form. On the right is the Q, or the quantity. All right, on the bottom, we'll use, uh, we'll calculate our Z, and we'll use the net evaluation row. The net evaluation row helps us to determine if we have an optimal solution or not. And then on the bottom right, when we're all done, we, we calculate you know, our max profit or a minim, minimum cost from the objective function. All right, the first thing we're gonna start out with base, the basis. You know, what variables and what constants do we put in the basis? And the rules for the initial basis are just that. There's one variable per constraint. So if we have two constraints, there'll be two variables in the basis. If we have three, three constraints, we'll have three variables, and so on. All right, so that's the first one, one variable per constraint. The second one, if there's slack, it goes in the basis. So we start with our S variable there for slack. Again, that's less than or equal to. Um, if there's no slack, number three, we use the artificial variable. So if we have a constraint that's a greater than or equal to or just an equal to, we put the artificial variable into the basis. All right, let's take a look at what, what this looks like now with let's numbers. Put it, start putting this into the initial tableau. It's kind of like Target, you know, we have an official table, we call it a tableau. All right, notice across the top, um, I've just put in the objective function, 40x1 plus 50x2 plus 0s1 plus 0s2 minus ma1 minus ma3. That was just our objective function in standard form. I've kind of stacked the variable on top of the coefficient because the C stands for coefficient and it just makes it more logical when we put them into the basis. Okay, in the middle, in our substitution rate, um, these are just our initial constraints. You don't have to write the constraint to the right. I just did it to help you visualize what's going on. Uh, we have 1x1 plus 2x2 plus 1s1 plus an artificial variable, a1. All right, um, same thing with constraint 2, same thing with constraint 3. 
What's important for the S's and the A's, these are what's called vector rows. You notice for each row, there's only one one per row, um, because that's the vector. Um, S1 only appears in the first variable. So you could almost set up your vector rows without even knowing the rest of the equation. Uh, just take a second and look at that. You notice that since our second variable had a minus s, there's a minus 1 in its vector rows. Okay, now we've filled in the basis. Again, we followed the rules for the basis. One variable per constraint. You can see I have three constraints, so I have three variables. Uh, the second is rule for the basis is if there's slack, we use, we use it in the basis. So you can see S2 is in the basis, and our uh, coefficient from the objective function is zero. So S2 and the coefficient is zero. Okay, then our third rule is if there's no slack, we use the artificial variable. Same thing, I have a1 and a3 are my artificial variables. Their coefficient from the objective function is minus m. Last, I finish filled in the q. The q is just quantity, um, but you can see for the initial feasible, our q is just the right-hand side of our uh, constraint. So for constraint 1 is 40, constraint 2 is 120, uh, for constraint 3 it's 20. This is one of the reasons why we use start at the origin. It makes it easy to set up our initial feasible solution.